Barry, in trying to look at different ways to understand reality, um, one way, obviously, are the laws of physics. That's where any scientist would start. Uh, in the last few decades, there's been a, a great deal of interest in the concept of emergence, that in addition to the fundamental laws of physics, which sort of have a deterministic way, even if quantum mechanics is indeterminate, it sort of is, is, is a, a deterministic uh, probability. Uh, but you need to add something else onto that, which at different levels of, hier of the hierarchies of the sciences, uh, um, you need some kind of emergent laws so that it would make sense above. Uh, you um, have, have written that, um, that you know, you, the, the question, do you need anything but physics? that the so-called special scientists, which I think means anything but physics, mm -hmm. uh, chemistry, biology, psychology, then you can get to economics, who knows what you get to. But I like to stick with biology and psychology. Is there any laws at that level which are emergent, which are uh, so, uh, so strongly emergent that they are not predictable by the underlying laws of physics? Well, I think it's important to distinguish two kinds of questions what we might call ontological or metaphysical questions on the one hand, and epistemological questions on the other. If you mean that somebody who was told, like Laplace's famous example of the demon who's told the positions and momenta of every particle in the universe, and let's say the demon had the language of psychology and biology, whether the demon could predict yeah. all of the regularities found in psychology and so on, I think the answer to that is, um, that the demon could predict if they really, really had the language and this demon had these superpowers, um, where, for example, there would be light living beings and where not living beings, where there would be volcanoes and where there would be oceans and so on. But I don't think human beings could do that. The, the predictions are way, way too complicated to be done. And there are some conceptual issues that get in the way too. So our description of the macros our macroscopic descriptions are inevitably vague. There's no clear point at which the Mediterranean Sea ends <laughs> and where the sand begins. It changes over time and, and so on. So I don't think that this is, so the epistemological question is could we actually do biology by just doing physics? And the answer is no. Well, On the other hand, the metaphysical yeah, question, yeah, yeah. are there regularities or laws of biology which don't in principle de are determined to be what they are from the fundamental physics. Mm -hmm. I think the answer to that is also no with a qualification. And the qualification but, is we won't be able to know it or understand it, but it really is no. there? The qualification is, is this, that physics is usually described in terms of the fundamental dynamical laws of physics. But I think that something more than the fundamental dynamical laws of physics are part of physics that will be needed in order to um, even understand how the higher level regularities fit into the lower level physics because the higher level regularities are generally probabilistic yeah. and they hold in sometimes ceteris paribus or only under certain circumstances and so on. Uh, so I think what one needs in addition to the fundamental dynamical laws of physics also what are sometimes thought of as the laws of statistical mechanics. Yeah. By that I don't mean the macroscopic laws of statistical mechanics like the second law of entropy. I mean what Boltzmann introduced to explain these the laws of thermodynamics, namely a probability distribution over all the micro states of the universe and the idea that the, um, the state of the universe and very early, what we call early times at the time of the Big Bang, had very, very tiny entropy. I do think that the package of the low entropy, the probability distribution, and the correct dynamical laws, which we don't know right now, but we have ideas about what they might be, I think them together are sufficient to, in principle, in Laplace's story, get the patterns and regularities of the higher level story. So I think I needed to add something to Laplace. Okay, but at the end of the day, you're saying that all of the regularities, the special kinds and relationships in biology, just to keep ourselves there, can ultimately, in principle, even if uh, 
uh, from an epistemological or our ability to do it, it might be never or it might be a million years from now. But in principle, you can be able to do that. Because I, strong emergence says you can't. That's right. Strong emergence says there's something that happens in some sense in the physical world that as you go up a level, the, 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 the laws of physics at the lowest levels will in principle not be able to make that jump uh, to that level of biology. That is right. I think the right thing to say about it is that my view that it can make the jump and the view that it can make ju the jump are both conjectures. And at this point, we don't really know. That's but a big question, though, isn't it? It is a big and central question. I think that the weight of reason is on the side of the can make the jump. And here's the reason I'm saying that. That if the jump couldn't be made, then there must be some ways in which the microphysical world evolves which can't be accounted for in terms of microphysics. Right. Okay. And the reason for that is that any change in the world at a macroscopic level, let's say that involved biology or psychology, can itself make for a change at the micro level a, because it could be registered a, in a computer, for example, be, in the spin that's, of that's, an electron. It has to be what it means. And so somebody who took the view of there being this kind of strong emergence would also be taking, having to take the view, I think, if they were going to hold that, and with a serious reason for it, to take the view that um, microphysics is, of its nature, incompletable. Now, that is a view that people have had. For example, Descartes uh, had that view back in, in the 17th century. Descartes held the view that the motions of human bodies, particularly the motions of our bodies when we produce language, cannot be accounted for just in a mechanical means. Now, he didn't know at all the right mechanical means or the right fundamental physical theory. But even in principle, he thought it couldn't be done because he thought that this could only be explained in terms of mentality. I do think that there are explanations in terms of mentality, but I also think that there are explanations in terms of fundamental physics, of why things happen the way they happen. So there's a kind of over-explanation. I don't think of this as over-determination because I don't think of the prior state or situation as, as in a fundamental way, determining the later one. Um, in a sense, though, causation was something that's fundamental. This is a bit fancy and complicated a discussion yeah. here. But for those people who think of causation as something that's fundamental, like a fluid which has to be given from one thing to another thing, uh, the philosopher <laughs> Jaguan Kim sometimes yeah. thinks about it like that, they might get worried that, look, how could it be that there's a physics causal explanation and also a psychological causal explanation, because there's just too much of this causal fluid. Yeah. And that seems a bit silly. But that's I don't the think over that's I just don't think of causation like that at all. I think of causation as just evolving truths like, look, if the psychological event hadn't occurred, then the physical event wouldn't have occurred. So if you hadn't have thought about elephants, you wouldn't have waved your hand like that. And um, there's also a physical counterfactual. If such and such had not gone on in your brain, you wouldn't have waved your hand like that. And these are perfectly compatible with each other.